英語聞き流しリスニング、英語テキストと MP3 音声ダウンロードはホームページからご利用いただけます。88thpp.com、88thpp.com。Fourth story: The Prince and Princess. Gerda was obliged to rest herself again when, exactly opposite to her, a large raven came hopping over the white snow. He had long been looking at Gerda and shaking his head. And now he said, Ka. Ka. Good day. Good day. He could not say it better, but he felt a sympathy for the little girl, and asked her where she was going all alone. The word alone Gerda understood quite well, and felt how much was expressed by it, so she told the raven her whole history, and asked if he had not seen K. a y The raven nodded very gravely, and said, It may be, it may be. What, do you really think so? cried the little girl, and she nearly squeezed the raven to death. So much did she kiss him. Gently, gently, said the raven. I think I know, I think that it may be little Kay. But now he has forgotten you for the princess. Does he live with a princess? asked Gerda. Yes, listen, said the raven, but it will be difficult for me to speak your language. If you understand the raven language, I can tell you better. No, I have not learned it, said Gerda, but my grandmother understands it, and she can speak gibberish too. I wish I had learned it. No matter, said the raven, I will tell you as well as I can, however, it will be bad enough. And then he told all he knew. In the kingdom where we now are, there lives a princess, who is extraordinarily clever, for she has read all the newspapers in the whole world, and has forgotten them again, so clever is she. She was lately, it is said, sitting on her throne, which is not very amusing after all, when she began humming an old tune, and it was just, Oh, why should I not be married? That song is not without its meaning. Said she, and so then she was determined to marry, but she would have a husband who knew how to give an answer when he was spoken to, not one who looked only as if he were a great personage, for that is so tiresome. She then had all the ladies of the court drum together, and when they heard her intention, all were very pleased, and said, We are very glad to hear it, it is the very thing we were thinking of. You may believe every word I say, said the raven, for I have a tame sweetheart that hops about in the palace quite free, and it was she who told me all this. The newspapers appeared forthwith with a border of hearts and the initials of the princess, and therein you might read that every good looking young man was at liberty to come to the palace and speak to the princess, and he who spoke in such wise as showed he felt himself at home there, that one the princess would choose for her husband. Yes, yes, said the raven, you may believe it, it is as true as I am sitting here. People came in crowds, there was a crush and a hurry, but no one was successful either on the first or second day. They could all talk well enough when they were out in the street. But as soon as they came inside the palace gates, and saw the guard richly dressed in silver, and the lackeys in gold on the staircase, and the large illuminated saloons, then they were abashed, and when they stood before the throne on which the princess was sitting, all they could do was to repeat the last word they had uttered, and to hear it again did not interest her very much. It was just as if the people within were under a charm, and had fallen into a trance till they came out again into the street, for then, oh, then, they could chatter enough. There was a whole row of them standing from the town gates to the palace. I was there myself to look, said the raven. They grew hungry and thirsty, but from the palace they got nothing whatever, not even a glass of water. Some of the cleverest, it is true, had taken bread and butter with them, but none shared it with his neighbor, for each thought, let him look hungry, and then the princess won't have him. But Kay, little Kay, said Gerda, when did he come? Was he among the number? Patience, patience, we are just come to him. It was on the third day when a little personage without horse or equipage came marching right boldly up to the palace. His eyes shone like yours, he had beautiful long hair, but his clothes were very shabby. That was Kay, cried Gerda, with a voice of delight. Oh, now I've found him! And she clapped her hands for joy. He had a little knapsack at his back, said the raven. No, that was certainly his sledge, said Gerda, for when he went away he took his sledge with him. That may be, said the raven. I did not examine him so minutely, but I know from my tame sweetheart, that when he came into the courtyard of the palace, and saw the bodyguard in silver, the lackeys on the staircase, he was not the least abashed, he nodded, and said to them, It must be very tiresome to stand on the stairs, for my part, I shall go in. The saloons were gleaming with lustres, privy councillors and excellencies were walking about barefooted, and wore gold keys, it was enough to make any one feel uncomfortable. His boots creaked, too, so loudly, But still he was not at all afraid. That's Kay for certain, said Gerda. I know he had on new boots, I have heard them creaking in Grandmama's room. Yes, they creaked, said the raven. 
and on he went boldly up to the princess, who was sitting on a pearl as large as a spinning wheel. All the ladies of the court, with their attendants and attendants' attendants, and all the cavaliers, with their gentlemen and gentlemen's gentlemen, stood round, and the nearer they stood to the door, the prouder they looked. It was hardly possible to look at the gentleman's gentleman, so very haughtily did he stand in the doorway. It must have been terrible, said little Gerda. And did Kay get the princess? Were I not a raven, I should have taken the princess myself, although I am promised. It is said he spoke as well as I speak when I talk raven language, this I learned from my tame sweetheart. He was bold and nicely behaved, he had not come to woo the princess, but only to hear her wisdom. She pleased him, and he pleased her. Yes, yes, for certain that was Kay, said Gerda. He was so clever, he could reckon fractions in his head. Oh, you take me to the palace. That is very easily said, answered the raven. But how are we to manage it? I'll speak to my tame sweetheart about it, she must advise us, for so much I must tell you, such a little girl as you are will never get permission to enter. Oh, yes I shall, said Gerda, when Kay hears that I am here, he will come out directly to fetch me. Wait for me here on these steps, said the raven. He moved his head backwards and forwards and flew away. The evening was closing in when the raven returned. Ka, ka, said he. She sends you her compliments, and here is a roll for you. She took it out of the kitchen, where there is bread enough. You are hungry, no doubt. It is not possible for you to enter the palace, for you are barefooted, the guards in silver and the lackeys in gold, would not allow it, but do not cry, you shall come in still. My sweetheart knows a little back stair that leads to the bedchamber, and she knows where she can get the key of it. And they went into the garden in the large avenue, where one leaf was falling after the other, and when the lights in the palace had all gradually disappeared, the raven led little Gerda to the back door, which stood half open. Oh, Gerda's heart beat with anxiety and longing. It was just as if she had been about to do something wrong, and yet she only wanted to know if little Kay was there. Yes, he must be there. She called to mind his intelligent eyes, and his long hair, so vividly, she could quite see him as he used to laugh when they were sitting under the roses at home. He will, no doubt, be glad to see you, to hear what a long way you have come for his sake, to know how unhappy all at home were when he did not come back. Oh, what a fright and a joy it was! They were now on the stairs. A single lamp was burning there, and on the floor stood the tame raven, turning her head on every side and looking at Gerda, who bowed as her grandmother had taught her to do. My intended has told me so much good of you, my dear young lady, said the tame raven. Your tale is very affecting. If you will take the lamp, I will go before. We will go straight on, for we shall meet no one. I think there is somebody just behind us, said Gerda, and something rushed past, it was like shadowy figures on the wall, horses with flowing manes and thin legs, huntsmen, ladies and gentlemen on horseback. They are only dreams, said the raven. They come to fetch the thoughts of the high personages to the chase, tis well, for now you can observe them in bed all the better. But let me find, when you enjoy honour and distinction, that you possess a grateful heart. Tut! That's not worth talking about, said the raven of the woods. They now entered the first saloon, which was of rose-coloured satin, with artificial flowers on the wall. Here the dreams were rushing past, but they hastened by so quickly that Goethe could not see the high personages. One hall was more magnificent than the other, one might indeed well be abashed, and at last they came into the bedchamber. The ceiling of the room resembled a large palm tree with leaves of glass, of costly glass, and in the middle, from a thick golden stem, hung two beds, each of which resembled a lily. One was white, and in this lay the princess, the other was red, and it was here that Gerda was to look for little Kay. She bent back one of the red leaves, and saw a brown neck. Oh! That was Kay. She called him quite loud by name, held the lamp towards him, the dreams rushed back again into the chamber, he awoke, turned his head, and, it was not little Kay. The prince was only like him about the neck, but he was young and handsome. And out of the white lily leaves the princess peeped, too, and asked what was the matter. Then little Gerda cried, and told her her whole history, and all that the ravens had done for her. Poor little thing! said the prince and the princess. They praised the ravens very much, and told them they were not at all angry with them, but they were not to do so again. However, they should have a reward. Will you fly about here at liberty, asked the princess, or would you like to have a fixed appointment as court ravens, with all the broken bits from the kitchen? And both the ravens nodded, and begged for a fixed appointment, for they thought of their old age, and said, it is a good thing to have a provision for our old days. And the prince got up and let Gerda sleep in his bed, and more than this he could not do. She folded her little hands and thought, how good men and animals are. And she then fell asleep and slept soundly. 
all the dreams flew in again, and they now looked like the angels, they drew a little sledge, in which little Kay sat and nodded his head, but the whole was only a dream and therefore it all vanished as soon as she awoke. The next day she was dressed from head to foot in silk and velvet. They offered to let her stay at the palace, and lead a happy life, but she begged to have a little carriage with a horse in front, and for a small pair of shoes, then, she said, she would again go forth in the wide world and look for Kay. Shoes and a muff were given her, she was, too, dressed very nicely, and when she was about to set off, a new carriage stopped before the door. It was of pure gold, and the arms of the prince and princess shone like a star upon it, the coachman, the footman, and the outriders, for outriders were there, too, all wore golden crowns. The prince and the princess assisted her into the carriage themselves, and wished her all success. The raven of the woods, who was now married, accompanied her for the first three miles. He sat beside Gerda, for he could not bear riding backwards, the other raven stood in the doorway, and flapped her wings, she could not accompany Gerda, because she suffered from headaches since she had had a fixed appointment and ate so much. The carriage was lined inside with sugar plums, and in the seats were fruits and gingerbread. Farewell! Farewell! cried prince and princess, and Gerda wept, and the raven wept. Thus passed the first miles, and then the raven bade her farewell, and this was the most painful separation of all. He flew into a tree, and beat his black wings as long as he could see the carriage, that shone from afar like a sunbeam. Fifth story. The Little Robber Maiden. They drove through the dark wood, but the carriage shone like a torch, and it dazzled the eyes of the robbers, so that they could not bear to look at it. Tis gold. Tis gold. They cried, and they rushed forward, seized the horses, knocked down the little postilion, the coachman, and the servants, and pulled little Gerda out of the carriage. How plump, how beautiful she is! She must have been fed on nut kernels, said the old female robber, who had a long, scrubby beard, and bushy eyebrows that hung down over her eyes. She is as good as a fatted lamb. How nice she will be! And then she drew out a knife, the blade of which shone so that it was quite dreadful to behold. Oh! cried the woman at the same moment. She had been bitten in the ear by her own little daughter, who hung at her back, and who was so wild and unmanageable, that it was quite amusing to see her. You naughty child! said the mother and now she had not time to kill Gerda. She shall play with me, said the little robber child. She shall give me her muff, and her pretty frock, she shall sleep in my bed. And then she gave her mother another bite, so that she jumped, and ran round with the pain, and the robbers laughed, and said, look, how she is dancing with the little one. I will go into the carriage, said the little robber maiden, and she would have her will, for she was very spoiled and very headstrong. She and Gerda got in, and then away they drove over the stumps of felled trees, deeper and deeper into the woods. The little robber maiden was as tall as Gerda, but stronger, broader-shouldered, and of dark complexion, her eyes were quite black, they looked almost melancholy. She embraced little Gerda, and said, They shall not kill you as long as I am not displeased with you. You are, doubtless, a princess? No, said little Gerda, who then related all that had happened to her, and how much she cared about little Kay. The little robber maiden looked at her with a serious air, nodded her head slightly, and said, They shall not kill you, even if I am angry with you, then I will do it myself, and she dried Gerda's eyes, and put both her hands in the handsome muff, which was so soft and warm. At length the carriage stopped. They were in the midst of the courtyard of a robber's castle. It was full of cracks from top to bottom, and out of the openings magpies and rooks were flying, and the great bulldogs, each of which looked as if he could swallow a man, jumped up, but they did not bark, for that was forbidden. In the midst of the large, old, smoking hall burned a great fire on the stone floor. The smoke disappeared under the stones, and had to seek its own egress. In an immense cauldron soup was boiling, and rabbits and hares were being roasted on a spit. You shall sleep with me tonight, with all my animals, said the little robber maiden. They had something to eat and drink, and then went into a corner, where straw and carpets were lying. Beside them, on laths and perches, sat nearly a hundred pigeons, all asleep, seemingly, but yet they moved a little when the robber maiden came. They are all mine, said she, at the same time seizing one that was next to her by the legs and shaking it so that its wings fluttered. Kiss it, cried the little girl, and flung the pigeon in Gerda's face. Up there is the rabble of the wood, continued she, pointing to several laths which were fastened before a hole high up in the wall, that's the rabble, they would all fly away immediately, if they were not well fastened in and here is my dear old Bach, and she laid hold of the horns of a reindeer, that had a bright copper ring round its neck, and was tethered to the spot. We are obliged to lock this fellow in too, or he would make his escape. Every evening I tickle his neck with my sharp knife, he is so frightened at it. 
and the little girl drew forth a long knife, from a crack in the wall, and let it glide over the reindeer's neck. The poor animal kicked, the girl laughed, and pulled Gerda into bed with her. Do you intend to keep your knife while you sleep? asked Gerda, looking at it rather fearfully. I always sleep with the knife, said the little robber maiden. There is no knowing what may happen. But tell me now, once more, all about little Kay, and why you have started off in the wide world alone. And Gerda related all, from the very beginning, the wood pigeons cooed above in their cage, and the others slept. The little robber maiden wound her arm round Gerda's neck, held the knife in the other hand, and snored so loud that everybody could hear her, but Gerda could not close her eyes, for she did not know whether she was to live or die. The robber sat round the fire, sang and drank, and the old female robber jumped about so, that it was quite dreadful for Gerda to see her. Then the wood pigeon said, Coo! Coo! We have seen little Kay. A white hen carries his sledge, he himself sat in the carriage of the Snow Queen, who passed here, down just over the wood, as we lay in our nest. She blew upon us young ones, and all died except we two. Coo! Coo! What is that you say up there? cried little Gerda. Where did the Snow Queen go to? Do you know anything about it? She is no doubt gone to Lapland, for there is always snow and ice there. Only ask the reindeer, who is tethered there. Ice and snow is there. There it is, glorious and beautiful. Said the reindeer. One can spring about in the large shining valleys. The Snow Queen has her summer tent there, but her fixed abode is high up towards the North Pole, on the island called Spitsbergen. Oh, Kay. Poor little Kay. Sighed Gerda. Do you choose to be quiet? Said the robber maiden. If you don't, I shall make you. In the morning Gerda told her all that the wood pigeons had said, and the little maiden looked very serious, but she nodded her head, and said, that's no matter, that's no matter. Do you know where Lapland lies? She asked of the reindeer. Who should know better than I? Said the animal, and his eyes rolled in his head. I was born and bred there, there I leapt about on the fields of snow. Listen, said the robber maiden to Gerda. You see that the men are gone, but my mother is still here, and will remain. However, towards morning she takes a draught out of the large flask, and then she sleeps a little, then I will do something for you. She now jumped out of bed, flew to her mother, with her arms round her neck, and pulling her by the beard, said, Good morrow, my own sweet nanny goat of a mother. And her mother took hold of her nose, and pinched it till it was red and blue, but this was all done out of pure love. When the mother had taken a sup at her flask, and was having a nap, the little robber maiden went to the reindeer, and said, I should very much like to give you still many a tickling with the sharp knife, for then you are so amusing, however, I will untether you, and help you out, so that you may go back to Lapland. But you must make good use of your legs, and take this little girl from me to the palace of the Snow Queen, where her playfellow is. You have heard, I suppose, all she said, for she spoke loud enough, and you were listening. The reindeer gave a bound for joy. The robber maiden lifted up little Gerda, and took the precaution to bind her fast on the reindeer's back. She even gave her a small cushion to sit on. Here are your worsted leggings, for it will be cold, but the muff I shall keep for myself, for it is so very pretty. But I do not wish you to be cold. Here is a pair of lined gloves of my mother's, they just reach up to your elbow. On with them. Now you look about the hands just like my ugly old mother. And Gerda wept for joy. I can't bear to see you fretting, said the little robber maiden. This is just the time when you ought to look pleased. Here are two loaves and a ham for you so that you won't starve. The bread and the meat were fastened to the reindeer's back, the little maiden opened the door, called in all the dogs, and then with her knife cut the rope that fastened the animal, and said to him, Now, off with you, but take good care of the little girl. And Gerda stretched out her hands with the large wadded gloves towards the robber maiden, and said, Farewell. And the reindeer flew on over bush and bramble through the great wood, over moor and heath, as fast as he could go. Dizza, dizza, was heard in the sky. It was just as if somebody was sneezing. These are my old northern lights, said the reindeer, look how they gleam. And on he now sped still quicker, day and night on he went, the loaves were consumed, and the ham too, and now they were in Lapland. Sixth story. The Lapland woman and the Finland woman. Suddenly they stopped before a little house, which looked very miserable. The roof reached to the ground, and the door was so low, that the family were obliged to creep upon their stomachs when they went in or out. Nobody was at home except an old Lapland woman, who was dressing fish by the light of an oil lamp. And the reindeer told her the whole of Gerda's history, but first of all his own, for that seemed to him of much greater importance. Gerda was so chilled that she could not speak. Poor thing, said the Lapland woman, you have far to run still. 
you have more than a hundred miles to go before you get to Finland, there the Snow Queen has her country house, and burns blue lights every evening. I will give you a few words from me, which I will write on a dried haberdeen, for paper I have none, this you can take with you to the Finland woman, and she will be able to give you more information than I can. When Gerda had warmed herself, and had eaten and drunk, the Lapland woman wrote a few words on a dried haberdeen, begged Gerda to take care of them, put her on the reindeer, bound her fast, and away sprang the animal. Diza, Diza, was again heard in the air, the most charming blue lights burned the whole night in the sky, and at last they came to Finland. They knocked at the chimney of the Finland woman, for as to a door, she had none. There was such a heat inside that the Finland woman herself went about almost naked. She was diminutive and dirty. She immediately loosened little Gerda's clothes, pulled off her thick gloves and boots, for otherwise the heat would have been too great, and after laying a piece of ice on the reindeer's head, read what was written on the fish skin. She read it three times, she then knew it by heart, so she put the fish into the cupboard, for it might very well be eaten, and she never threw anything away. Then the reindeer related his own story first, and afterwards that of little Gerda, and the Finland woman winked her eyes, but said nothing. You are so clever, said the reindeer, you can, I know, twist all the winds of the world together in a knot. If the seaman loosens one knot, then he has a good wind, if a second, then it blows pretty stiffly, if he undoes the third and fourth, then it rages so that the forests are upturned. Will you give the little maiden a potion, that she may possess the strength of twelve men, and vanquish the Snow Queen? The strength of twelve men, said the Finland woman. Much good that would be. Then she went to a cupboard, and drew out a large skin rolled up. When she had unrolled it, strange characters were to be seen written thereon, and the Finland woman read at such a rate that the perspiration trickled down her forehead. But the reindeer begged so hard for little Gerda, and Gerda looked so imploringly with tearful eyes at the Finland woman, that she winked, and drew the reindeer aside into a corner, where they whispered together, while the animal got some fresh ice put on his head. Tis true little Kay is at the Snow Queen's, and finds everything there quite to his taste, and he thinks it the very best place in the world, but the reason of that is, he has a splendor of glass in his eye, and in his heart. These must be got out first, otherwise he will never go back to mankind and the Snow Queen will retain her power over him. But can you give little Gerda nothing to take which will undo her with power over the whole? I can give her no more power than what she has already. Don't you see how great it is? Don't you see how man and animals are forced to serve her, how well she gets through the world barefooted? She must not hear of her power from us, that power lies in her heart, because she is a sweet and innocent child. If she cannot get to the Snow Queen by herself, and rid little Kay of the glass, we cannot help her. Two miles hence the garden of the Snow Queen begins, thither you may carry the little girl. Set her down by the large bush with red berries, standing in the snow, don't stay talking, but hasten back as fast as possible. And now the Finland woman placed little Gerda on the reindeer's back, and off he ran with all imaginable speed. Oh! I have not got my boots. I have not brought my gloves. Cried little Gerda. She remarked she was without them from the cutting frost, but the reindeer dared not stand still. On he ran till he came to the great bush with the red berries, and there he set Gerda down, kissed her mouth, while large bright tears flowed from the animal's eyes, and then back he went as fast as possible. There stood poor Gerda now, without shoes or gloves, in the very middle of dreadful icy Finland. She ran on as fast as she could. There then came a whole regiment of snowflakes, but they did not fall from above, and they were quite bright and shining from the aurora borealis. The flakes ran along the ground, and the nearer they came the larger they grew. Gerda well remembered how large and strange the snowflakes appeared when she once saw them through a magnifying glass, but now they were large and terrific in another manner, they were all alive. They were the outposts of the Snow Queen. They had the most wondrous shapes, some looked like large ugly porcupines, others like snakes knotted together, with their heads sticking out, and others, again, like small fat bears, with the hair standing on end, all were of dazzling whiteness, all were living snowflakes. Little Gerda repeated the Lord's Prayer. The cold was so intense that she could see her own breath, which came like smoke out of her mouth. It grew thicker and thicker, and took the form of little angels, that grew more and more when they touched the earth. All had helms on their heads, and lances and shields in their hands, they increased in numbers, and when Gerda had finished the Lord's Prayer, she was surrounded by a whole legion. They thrust at the horrid snowflakes with their spears, so that they flew into a thousand pieces, and little Gerda walked on bravely and in security. The angels patted her hands and feet and then she felt the cold less, and went on quickly towards the palace of the Snow Queen. But now we shall see how Kay fared. He never thought of Gerda, and least of all that she was standing before the palace. Seventh Story 
what took place in the palace of the Snow Queen, and what happened afterward. The walls of the palace were of driving snow, and the windows and doors of cutting winds. There were more than a hundred halls there, according as the snow was driven by the winds. The largest was many miles in extent, all were lighted up by the powerful aurora borealis, and all were so large, so empty, so icy cold, and so resplendent. Mirth never reigned there, there was never even a little bear ball, with the storm for music, while the polar bears went on their hind legs and showed off their steps. Never a little tea party of white young lady foxes, vast, cold, and empty were the halls of the Snow Queen. The northern lights shone with such precision that one could tell exactly when they were at their highest or lowest degree of brightness. In the middle of the empty, endless hall of snow, was a frozen lake, it was cracked in a thousand pieces, but each piece was so like the other, that it seemed the work of a cunning artificer. In the middle of this lake sat the Snow Queen when she was at home, and then she said she was sitting in the mirror of understanding, and that this was the only one, and the best thing in the world. Little Kay was quite blue, yes nearly black with cold, but he did not observe it, for she had kissed away all feeling of cold from his body, and his heart was a lump of ice. He was dragging along some pointed flat pieces of ice, which he laid together in all possible ways, for he wanted to make something with them, just as we have little flat pieces of wood to make geometrical figures with, called the Chinese puzzle. Kay made all sorts of figures, the most complicated, for it was a nice puzzle for the understanding. In his eyes the figures were extraordinarily beautiful, and of the utmost importance, for the bit of glass which was in his eye caused this. He found whole figures which represented a written word, but he never could manage to represent just the word he wanted, that word was eternity, and the Snow Queen had said, if you can discover that figure, you shall be your own master, and I will make you a present of the whole world and a pair of new skates. But he could not find it out. I am going now to warm lands, said the Snow Queen. I must have a look down into the black cauldrons. It was the volcanoes Vesuvius and Etna that she meant. I will just give them a coating of white, for that is as it ought to be, besides, it is good for the oranges and the grapes. And then away she flew, and Kay sat quite alone in the empty halls of ice that were miles long, and looked at the blocks of ice, and thought and thought till his skull was almost cracked. There he sat quite benumbed and motionless, one would have imagined he was frozen to death. Suddenly little Gerda stepped through the great portal into the palace. The gate was formed of cutting winds, but Gerda repeated her evening prayer, and the winds were laid as though they slept, and the little maiden entered the vast, empty, cold halls. There she beheld Kay, she recognized him, flew to embrace him, and cried out, her arms firmly holding him the while, Kay, sweet little Kay! Have I then found you at last? But he sat quite still, benumbed and cold. Then little Gerda shed burning tears, and they fell on his bosom, they penetrated to his heart, they thawed the lumps of ice, and consumed the splinters of the looking-glass, he looked at her, and she sang the hymn. The rose in the valley is blooming so sweet, and angels descend there the children to greet. Hereupon Kay burst into tears, he wept so much that the splinter rolled out of his eye, and he recognized her, and shouted, Gerda, sweet little Gerda! Where have you been so long? And where have I been? He looked round him. How cold it is here! said he. How empty and cold! And he held fast by Gerda, who laughed and wept for joy. It was so beautiful, that even the blocks of ice danced about for joy, and when they were tired and laid themselves down, they formed exactly the letters which the Snow Queen had told him to find out, so now he was his own master, and he would have the whole world and a pair of new skates into the bargain. Gerda kissed his cheeks, and they grew quite blooming, she kissed his eyes, and they shone like her own, she kissed his hands and feet, and he was again well and merry. The Snow Queen might come back as soon as she liked, there stood his discharge written in resplendent masses of ice. They took each other by the hand, and wandered forth out of the large hall, they talked of their old grandmother, and of the roses upon the roof, and wherever they went, the wind ceased raging, and the sun burst forth. And when they reached the bush with the red berries, they found the reindeer waiting for them. He had brought another, a young one, with him, whose udder was filled with milk, which he gave to the little ones, and kissed their lips. They then carried Kay and Gerda, first to the Finland woman, where they warmed themselves in the warm room, and learned what they were to do on their journey home, and they went to the Lapland woman, who made some new clothes for them and repaired their sledges. The reindeer and the young hind leapt along beside them, and accompanied them to the boundary of the country. Here the first vegetation peeped forth, here Kay and Gerda took leave of the Lapland woman. Farewell! Farewell! They all said. And the first green buds appeared, the first little birds began to cheer up, and out of the wood came, riding on a magnificent horse, which Gerda knew, it was one of the leaders in the golden carriage, a young damsel with a bright red cap on her head, and armed with pistols. It was the little robber maiden, who, tired of being at home, 
had determined to make a journey to the north, and afterwards in another direction, if that did not please her. She recognized Gerda immediately, and Gerda knew her too. It was a joyful meeting. You are a fine fellow for tramping about, said she to little Kay, I should like to know, Faith, if you deserve that one should run from one end of the world to the other for your sake? But Gerda patted her cheeks, and inquired for the prince and princess. They are gone abroad, said the other. But the raven? asked little Gerda. Oh! The raven is dead, she answered. His tame sweetheart is a widow, and wears a bit of black worsted round her leg, she laments most piteously, but it's all mere talk and stuff. Now tell me what you've been doing and how you managed to catch him. And Gerda and Kay both told their story. And schnip schnap schnur basseler, said the robber maiden, and she took the hands of each, and promised that if she should some day pass through the town where they lived, she would come and visit them, and then away she rode. Kay and Gerda took each other's hand, it was lovely spring weather, with abundance of flowers and a verdure. The church bells rang, and the children recognized the high towers, and the large town, it was that in which they dwelt. They entered and hastened up to their grandmother's room, where everything was standing as formerly. The clock said tick. Tack. And the finger moved round, but as they entered, they remarked that they were now grown up. The roses on the leads hung blooming in at the open window, there stood the little children's chairs, and Kay and Gerda sat down on them, holding each other by the hand, they both had forgotten the cold empty splendor of the Snow Queen, as though it had been a dream. The grandmother sat in the bright sunshine, and read aloud from the Bible, Unless ye become as little children, ye cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And Kay and Gerda looked in each other's eyes, and all at once they understood the old hymn. The rose in the valley is blooming so sweet, and angels descend there the children to greet. There sat the two grown-up persons, grown up, and yet children, children at least in heart, and it was summertime, summer, glorious summer. Listening, English text to MP3音声ダウンロードはホームページからご利用いただけます。88thpp.com88thpp.com